okay, I think we've got a few people in now. Um, so good evening and thank you for joining us um, tonight for our session on understanding the role GPs play in community palliative care. My name is Jen Francis. I'm the lead for palliative care and older adults here at the Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network um, and leading our work on the Greater Choice Bat Home Palliative Care Project. Uh, I'd just like to start the session by acknowledging um, on behalf of Northwestern Melbourne PHN and Banksia Palliative Care, uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're presenting from this evening, um, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, the Boonwurrung people and the Wathaurong people of the Kulin Nation. We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as any First Nations people joining us this evening. Uh, just some housekeeping. Um, so we do have all attendees muted, but you can ask questions via the Q&A box. If you can pop them in there, uh, we can keep track and we'll um, have a, a Q&A portion partway through the session as well as at the end. So um, please pop them in there as you think of them and we'll um, make sure that they're covered uh, in the content or at the Q&A uh, checkpoints. Uh, the session is being recorded, um, so any questions will be asked anonymously, um, so you won't be named, um, and the recording will be made available. Uh, please make sure you've joined the webinar using the name you registered with um, for CPD purposes. Um, we go by the Zoom attendance list that um, goes by whatever your login display name is. So if you're not sure if your name matches, um, please just send a chat message um, to NWM PHN Education um, and my colleague Danielle will make sure that your attendance is noted if your name uh, might be displaying a bit differently. Um, yeah, so welcome. Uh, as I said, so tonight's session is delivered in partnership with Banksia Palliative Care. So tonight we have um, Dr. Chien Lin, who is a palliative medicine specialist during the week and still a practicing GP on Saturdays. Uh, and we also have Amanda Petricola, a clinical services lead with Banksia Palliative Care. Uh, so I will hand over to, uh, I think Amanda is kicking off. Um, and yeah, we hope you enjoy the session. Yeah, thank you, Jen. So I'm Amanda Petricola, Clinical Service Lead with Banksia Palliative Care. Um, I'm discussing tonight uh, what's my role, um, uh, understanding the role of GPs play in the community with palliative care. Um, firstly, a bit about Banksia. Uh, Banksia Palliative Care Service is a not-for-profit organisation. And, and the sole state government funded community palliative care service for three local government areas, Banyul, Nilambic and uh, Whittlesea. Um, we provide 24 hour palliative care service for a population of approximately 420,000 people over an area of a thousand square kilometres. Over the last 30 years, Banksia Palliative Care has provided no cost expertise and practical support to children and adults with living with life limiting illnesses, supporting them in their homes and decreasing the need for hospital visits and stays. Um, at present, we have about um, approximately, I think it's about 420 uh, clients on our books. How do I move to the next? Thank you. So a snapshot of Banksia, these are the numbers from 2022. We received 1,051 referrals. Referrals can be from um, clients themselves, self-referrals, relatives or friends. We had 110 referrals that way. We've also received referrals from GPs and other health specialists. There were 352 of them. In the aged care setting, we've had aged care and aged care related services, 181 referrals and then the majority is from hospitals and inpatient acute care palliative care services. We did out of those referrals have um, 855 admissions to the service, uh, non-malignant um, illness 338 and then malignant is our major 
a clientele 517 and deaths on uh, books for 2022 748 clients of that 308 um, died back in the hospital setting 219 in a palliative care unit and 89 in the acute service and then we did have 440 people die in their homes but that was um, a mix of um, private residents and aged care settings. Um, an overview of tonight's session, we'll talk about who is Banksia, uh, what is palliative care and how it's delivered, and the role of the community palliative care service, what supports community palliative care can provide. Um, I will do a, a case study. We'll talk about interventions, medications and practical supports to enable end of life care at home. A bit about bereavement um, and then verification and certification of death in the community. So what is palliative care? Oh, that's you. Sorry, Jen, is that you? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak to this topic. And um, in, in terms of definition, palliative care is person and family centered care provided for a person with an active, progressive, advanced disease with little or no prospect of cure and who is expected to die and for whom the primary treatment goal is to optimize the quality of life. And this is listed on the Palliative Care Australia website. Key point is um, there is a life limiting illness and that there is a um, expectation that a death would occur usually within six to 12 months. But of course, um, that can be a risk and uh, it can be a potentially curative young patients, life transplant patients. And, um, and it, also in terms of uh, increasing um, uh, development in, in cancer treatments as well, people are living longer and longer. And, um, but the key is uh, that there is a risk of people dying uh, within the next six to 12 months. And yes, uh, even though they may be curative, um, uh, one is uh, they may not be, two is they may have complex symptoms uh, during that time as well. The focus is quality of life, and that can be in addition to the treatment focus as well. So it's not just that they have to be completely focused on quality of their life, but there's a recognition that um, that needs to be, um, they need additional support for that. Um, okay, next slide. Yeah. So it doesn't mean no care. So people can receive palliative care together with other treatments, uh, therapies that can for long life. Again, in fact, um, if people, um, if we're not able to treat or uh, fix the problem, they often need even more care. So uh, it's definitely, there's nothing we can do for you. Uh, but in fact, it's much more we need to be doing for you if uh, we're not able to treat your illness. Um, it aims to enhance quality of life and help patients live as actively as possible. It regards dying as a normal process um, and provides relief from pain and other symptoms. Intense need to hasten or postpone death and um, integrates the psychological and spiritual aspects of care. Uses a team approach to address the needs of patients and their families. Offers a support system to help family cope during patients' illness and, and bereavement. So anyone, adults and children, as we discussed before, can uh, benefit from uh, palliative care if they have a life-limiting or threatening uh, illness or condition. Most commonly is cancer, um, uh, and increasingly we recognize neurological disease, uh, other end-stage organ diseases, including heart, lung, and kidney diseases, dementia, and inherited metabolic disorders all carry with them increasing disease and care burden um, as we move towards the uh, pointy end. So who provides palliative care? So we divided in a sense that there are specialists and generalist palliative care. Saying that though, 
um, it's defined more by uh, the focus of the service rather than uh, academic slash other um, other special specialty type of you know, anatomical or disease um, based uh, demarcations. So one would argue palliative care is in fact a generalist specialty <laughs> in the sense that we don't differentiate based on procedures or diseases, but rather it's by um, by the situation and uh, and also by um, the focus of the service. And um, everyone, it's essentially everyone's business and we have nurses, personal care assistants, family being probably the biggest uh, care provider when people are living at home, which is 98% of the time. And um, even if they're tra traveling to hospital frequently, um, most of the care living with advanced illness occurs at home. And therefore GPs, their current treating oncologists and geriatricians uh, continue to be involved. And in fact, GPs are the biggest group of um, palliative care provider. And specialist palliative care services um, with multidisciplinary teams and uh, specialized skills, competencies, experience, probably more than anything else, and training for more complex needs are available. And um, in consultation, or to share some of the care, but not to take over the primary care team, but it's in addition. So people can be at home, and in fact, 98% of the time, even if they end up eventually in the hospital, they're primarily at home, and that includes the aged care facilities. Um, they can be in the specialized palliative care unit in the, in the hospital or in, in other wards in the hospital, um, and anywhere else that the person identifies as being their home. So to focus on the community, so why do we focus on the community? In palliative care settings, um, people overwhelmingly want to remain at home at, at the time of death. And uh, quoting a systematic review back in 2013, um, worldwide data showed that 70% of people preference will be at home if possible, and 19% will be in hospital. Um, in Australia, the South Australian study quoted here um, has a 2,500 respondent survey that uh, also 70% of Australians want to die at home. But where do people actually end up in? So in fact, only 14% um, end up in at home and about 30% in aged care and majority is still in hospital. So yeah, so that's why we're all very interested in um, supporting this and making this happen where possible and where preferred. And by, hopefully by attending today's uh, and on upcoming other seminars, that together with us, we can help improve this number and also overall quality of life and care of our shared patients. So what sort of support um, can community health care provide? We have um, specialized teams of health professionals, including primarily palliative care nurses, if it's nursing led, nursing coordinated service. And we have social workers, um, bereavement counselors, occupational therapists. Um, and recently, in fact, we're going to introduce physiotherapists as well, uh, music massage therapists, um, client support volunteers, and also the Health care specialists and physicians. As we referred to before, we do have access to support 24 7, and that comes in terms of 24 7 uh, phone support, which may trigger unplanned uh, visits from the nurses if it looks like something that can be troubleshot and managed at home. And um, uh, primarily focused on symptom relief and, um, and we can coordinate um, equipment to aid care at home and um, also have social work input for sensitive complex issues and care planning. 
and the music and massage therapy to uh, improve the quality of life and, um, and also aid symptom management. And there are respite and support that can be coordinated through community palliative care. And we can also arrange direct admissions to PCU, which then um, avoid the, the need to go to ED. So rather people wait at home than wait in ED for a bed if there's no need for further investigations and treatments. So now so I'm I'd... back over to Amanda. <laughs> so thank you. Well, Jim. Case study. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to talk about a case study. Um, I thought the best way to illustrate how community palliative care service in collaboration with clients' GPs can support the deaf at home was with a brief case study. It's not overly complicated, but it's quite a common scenario. We have Mark, uh, he was referred at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday by an aged care case manager, it was marked as urgent. There was no medical information provided in the referral. The intake team uh, called to the home to triage with the family. Um, issues were now trouble getting out of bed, uh, eating, drinking, small amounts, pain, shortness of breath, cough and functional decline or symptoms, multiple hospital admissions recently and the aim wanting to remain at home for end of life care. Um, so medical information was requested and sent to the GP and the local hospital. So background, Mark is a 76 year old with end stage COPD. Past medical history there, chronic back pain, asthma, hyperlipidemia, left total knee replacement, uh, three admissions in the past six months, significant functional decline over the past three months, uh, and now essentially chair bound with mild shortness of breath at rest. As a family, a wife, two adult children, and four grandchildren. I'll just talk about so the medical information we received could determine that Mark had end stage COPD. Uh, his past medical history, um, I did read out before. Uh, the fact he's had um, three admissions to hospital over the past six months, chest infections and exacerbation of COPD, with the most recent one being two weeks ago. And his wife, Sarah, um, was very distressed over the phone. Her aim also wanting to keep Mark at home, but quite concerned about essentially how to look after him. Now he's bed bound with increasing symptoms. Um, the two children work full time and have young children of their own, so supportive but not able to have any hands on. Um, community palliative care service assessment. So we've gone in, the nurse has assessed him at 10 o'clock the next day, the Thursday. Quite significant symptom burden there, shortness of breath, most moist cough, has back pain. Minimal oral intake, fluids only now. Dry mouth, difficulty with swallowing any tablets. Uh, no problems with gastrointestinal symptoms. Functional decline, but high increase in care needs. His wife is quite distressed about this deterioration. And we have a GP that is only available Monday to Wednesday and last seen four months ago. Um, he has had a telehealth appointment three weeks prior to this to the recent hospital admission. The GP works for those Monday to Wednesday and also has a current level two package, home care package. He's provided with hygiene three times a week and respite for two hours every fortnight. Uh, Mark has seen another GP in the clinic. Um, however, they are also currently away on leave. Are the medications involved? We note that he does have an allergy to morphine, severe nausea and vomiting, 
Um, a slow release background of Tarjan 10 is having breakthrough oxycodone available five milligrams QID orally and oral and inhalers there, inhalers and prednisolone 10 milligrams daily. Um, so we have noted the allergy for to morphine um, causing nausea and vomiting, uh, sometimes more an effect of an, a side effect than allergy. It possibly could have been managed with um, antiemetics, but we will avoid if we if we can. Um, we note he's been on Tarjan for about six months, um, using oxycodone quite regularly every four to six hours, and prednisolone weaned to 10. Thank you, Jim. So now for the considerations for dying at home, we really need the GP to be engaged and have discussions about providing the death certificate. Uh, we'll have discussions on um, equipment needs, providing of hospital beds, air mattresses, um, and access to end of life comfort care medications. So that would be our injectable uh, SOS medications. We would have regular nursing visits. With Banksia in the terminal phase, that's daily nursing visits. So we would visit every day and then we do have um, access to the after hour support. So we do have a night duty nurse. Uh, we have a triage, a hospital that triages the calls and then the nurse will be uh, called out to the home uh, for any um, increase symptom needs, injectable medication needs or, or distress of family. Uh, so we need also to provide practical and emotional support for the family, for the wife and family, and then also to provide that bereavement support for family post Mark's death. So the community palliative care service follow up on the day of assessment. So Mark is clearly deteriorating, uh, likely to enter the terminal phase. That uh, His wish is to die at home. So the nurse involved would contact the GP clinic. Um, so the symptom management involved at the minute, we've got a fentanyl patch on. We've seized Tarjan, we've gone to a fentanyl patch. While he's swallowing, we've got oxynorm liquid involved for breakthrough pain, shortness of breath. Uh, when swallowing isn't um, an option anymore, we're going to the injectable medications where we've changed to hydromorphone now, seeing as an allergy to morphine. Uh, metoclopramide, clonazepam for sedation, and then the buscapan if he needs sed uh, secretions. There is a guideline on Safe Care Victoria, Safer Care Victoria, Palliative Care Clinical Guidelines. Um, so the nurse would call the GP clinic. Uh, no doctors were available that had seen Mark, but there was a GP available uh, that the regular GP knew could say that the GP knew him well and felt that they would be comfortable um, to support end of life care at home. With the nurse agreeing with that, uh, we were able to call our palliative care consultant and um, have scripts provided through our physicians. Um, thank you. So that's this is one way we coordinate. We do send a fax requesting the medications. We give a guide and an update, performance status, now bed bound, uh, what the symptoms are, we were talking shortness of breath and pain, and what we would suggest, what we would request. So um, this is an escalation to the GP of the care we would like and medications we would like. So this is a guide for writing up breakthrough medications and syringe, syringe drivers. Certainly with the change to hydromorphone, we would um, edit this to have hydromorphone and the dose range uh, in this case. So we do provide a guide and also on the next page, we provide 
an order, a medication order, and ask for it to be filled in, please, and returned so the nurses can administer the injectable medications when appropriate. Thank you. Um, so common medications used at end of life. So the medications play an integral part in the management of symptoms for life-limiting illnesses and optimising comfort. Injectable medications may be required when a person can no longer tolerate oral medications. Common medications used during end-of-life phase include for pain we have morphine, hydromorph and fentanyl. We do have to consider what is hard to get in the community. Um, so we, we need to plan appropriately and have access to these medications in pharmacies, local pharmacies. Um, for nausea control, metoclopramide, haloperidol and cyclozine, agitation, uh, clonazepam, midazolam and haloperidol. And then with secretions, we have our glycopyrrolate, atropine and hyacine, butyl bromide. So uh, the palliative care service follow up on the day of assessment or well, education is provided to the carers. So we, the nurses will explain what the medications are used for and how to use them. We will actually draw the medications up, label it, explain and educate the family for them to use the medications under our guidance if they feel comfortable. Certainly, if they don't feel comfortable, the nurses will attend. It is more timely if families feel supported enough to give the medications. So we do provide verbal and written information. Um, we give practical education. So we do bed-based care. We will show uh, through our um, care support program how to care for someone who is bed-bound. We'll show them how to do a hygiene wash for mouth care, how to attend mouth care, pressure area care, how to move them around in the bed with the slide sheets. So family education on um, how to care for their loved one once they're bed bound uh, is a big part of our service. So that, that's the carer needs. We do offer respite. Um, we have... We assess their bereavement risk and discuss about funeral plans. We do have a social work, social work involvement with that. We have um, equipment. We request equipment and have hospital beds and air mattresses deliver delivered as soon as possible. Hopefully the next day or within we've timed it right the next day to the following day. Um, and referrals can be made to care a gateway for funding for more respite support. So the nurse would then go back to Banksia office, the handover to the team. The nursing team leader would um, be informed as well as the rest of the team um, an update that now that client is in terminal phase and what the plan is. Um, we would update the GP clinic. So we would hope to speak to the GP if that was possible, call and speak to the GP with a courtesy call to say what we've found and the current situation of the terminal phase. If that's not possible, then it's documented in a letter and faxed to the GP. Regular visits are planned. Um, it's on a needs basis. If we think someone is entering terminal, it's it's daily visits. If we're not quite there yet, it's you know every second daily with res rapid response. If the family was to call, we would respond uh, that day. Um, and social work is also informed about providing ongoing support at this time. We do have after hours uh, an after hours paging service. So for this um, situation and after a page was put through on the Sunday evening, the family has informed about deteriorating phase. Um, there's 
no swallow now. The chest, his chest infections worsened and he's become restless. We've got our injectable medications there for these situations. Um, the nurse would be called out during the evening and um, these injectable medications would be initiated. We've identified terminal phase now. So from a rapid deterioration on a Sunday night, we've been able to initiate the injectable medications, identify terminal phase on the Monday morning with contact to the GP to um, inform of the situation, um, to inform we've still got ongoing symptoms of sh shortness of breath, restlessness and secretions. On that discussion, it's been determined a syringe driver would be more appropriate than PRN medications breakthroughs. So on the Tuesday, we've commenced a um, syringe driver. Syringe driver consisting of hydromorphone, three milligrams, buscopan 80. The secretions, midazolam 10 milligrams in the 24 hours. There would also be breakthrough medications drawn up as well. There would be um, breakthroughs if it was indicated that any extras would be required. Um, with this terminal phase, it's daily nursing visits now. The nurses would support the family during the day and have uh, the um, assistance at night if it was needed. The enrolled nurses now come in for daily hygiene care. In terminal phase, uh, enrolled nurses have um, a hygiene program. They will be there every day for personal care. In this case study, it's identified Mark died comfortably on the Friday night. So from that syringe driver on the Tuesday, daily visits, support at night, um, and with the death at home of Mark on the Friday night at 11 p.m. The Banksia nurse uh, was called out to verify the death at home. The GP's also notified of the death through a fax and then bereavement support is offered for the family. So the take home message for this case study, the GP available for GP availability and ongoing support, having prompt access to injectable medications, um, being able to provide equipment, hospital beds, having the increased carer supports, being able to have regular palliative care nursing support, the ongoing social work for a family and the verification of death through the Banksia nurses and then the provision of the death certificate through the GP involvement um, makes this successful for to have a death at home. Um, on reflection, this was a case of a late referral, having a referral um, from referral to death within, what's that, seven days? Just over seven days, eight days is quite a short period of time. Ideally, we would have been involved a lot earlier. If the referral was earlier, we could have had relationship building, certainly um, uh, more family involvement and support. But certainly his wish to die at home was achieved. A lot of our patients are on our books for many months. We have got some long-term uh, two years plus clients um, that we class as stable. We actually do have a program where we discharge clients off our books and then um, they can certainly contact us again and be readmitted if deterioration um, has occurred. So the common interventions, medications and practical supports to enable end of life care at home. Uh, interventions, so with the regular nursing visits, we've got experienced RNs for symptom management. Um, for the trajectory of patients, uh, emergency provision of equipment, 
So we do have an equipment pool that we're able to access quickly and have delivered. We do have funding for six weeks of that equipment. Um, the support from social work and then the family support workers, grief counsellors to provide emotional support and um, social support to clients and their carers. And then the allied health involvement input, such as the music therapy and massage therapy. So um, medications that enable end of life care to be at home. We've got the registered nurses and senior nurses uh, that provide specialist advice and symptom management with medications. We have the GP involvement. The GP is, remains the main treating doctor. They are our first port of call. The, the registered nurses will always call the GPs first. Um, we will often ask for anticipatory medications. If the goals of care are for comfort measures in the event of deterioration, having the anticipatory medications in the home prevents the unnecessary hospitalisation and suffering. Um, palliative care physicians available for specialist support advice around complex cases. So certainly we always go to the GPs first. If there's a symptom that is needs a more specialist uh, input, then certainly we have the backup of our palliative care physicians. I'm oh, sorry, practical support. Access to the 24 seven phone number with visiting service to provide specialist advice on symptom management and end of life issues. We do have a paging service with an in-charge nurse to receive all those calls for advice and guidance, um, and certainly the call out if it's deemed urgent. We have an enrolled nurse team that provides training for the family, provides personal care, and in some cases, we also assist in the hands-on personal care in the terminal phase. We actually do that daily hire hygiene assistance for terminal phase and then registered nurses provide counselling to family about what to expect at the time of death. We certainly have long conversations of what this death is going to look like and um, and how to attend and how, sorry, and can attend the home to verify the death. So with the death at home, we will be called out to verify the death and support the family at that time. So I think this might be. Thanks, Amanda, for uh, going through uh, the case uh, in a comprehensive manner. And um, and really uh, just wanted to highlight, uh, there's a, depending on where you live, there's different uh, community palliative care services mm -hmm. in, in Victoria. And, uh, and, people, and we'll come back to that later and people can look up in terms of where their patients live. Um, which service provides uh, the, the community palliative care. Most of the services that we described are universal and there may be some small differences, but it's always uh, important to check with the local service. So uh, I want to talk about a bit more the certification of cause of death. Now, um, uh, so we do approach the general practitioners if the death occurs at home. Um, and that's because uh, the, the GPs remain the main doctor um, when people are living and dying at home. It's different if it comes to hospital. If they die in hospital, of course, then we take over the care. But um, uh, if, at home, the person's main doctor is their own doctor. Therefore, they are approached first. Um, so certification is for legal purposes for validity of a will or life insurance payment, for statistical and public health purposes, uh, for Bureau of Statistics um, and to, for preventive and public health uh, improvements, and uh, for family members, uh, again, for preventive purposes, but also, so, um, also to know what caused the death uh, for other family members, and um, in terms of safeguard purposes.
is, is to prevent disposal of bodies without professional scrutiny in relation to suspicious deaths. So it's very much less clinical, but much more medical legal. And, and certainly the last has happened, and, uh, and that's why there is a system in place. Um, so we, we keep track of everyone. So coming back to verification and certification. So verification is the examination of the signs of life, is to confirm that death has occurred, and uh, our nurses will attend and complete the verification of death. Uh, and then notify um, the primary health provider, the nominated GP, um, and who can then proceed to uh, provide the certification, which is more the paperwork side of things. The body can be transferred um, to the funeral service once verification occurs. But the funeral, so the actual um, cremation or burial or, or the funeral cannot happen before the certification happens. Okay, next slide. Sir. So in terms of eligibility, and we specifically want to talk through this is because there can be some confusion in terms of the wording of the certificate. So, um, but this Marriages Act, um, 1996 says, a doctor who's responsible for a person's medical care immediately before death or who examines the body of the deceased person after death must, within 40 hours, uh, notify the registrar of death and um, the cause of death in form and manner approved by the registrar in specifying any prescribed particulars. So what that actually means is that um, if, uh, in terms of people who are at home, even though they may not actually have further medical needs, because um, in the sense that it's because there's no treatment left, therefore um, they may, not, may or may not need further medical decisions. Um, they are still under a doctor's care, and if they're at home, they're under the GPs. Um, just like if they're in the hospital, they'll be under a cardiology back card or under palliative care card, for example. But at home, they're under the family doctor or their nominated family doctor. So. Um, uh, if there was no one, um, and, and this has happened, people can die without ever seeing a doctor, and that can happen. Uh, what happens is then, um, uh, if there were some uh, some notes to say, um, to, to be able to confirm the cause of death, then um, a, a medical practitioner actually needs to examine the disease, and, and more so that to confirm there is a, a a death of a person and the identity of that, then um, if they're satisfied with the information available to them, then they can uh, then complete the certification. The cause of death is the disease or injury which initiated a train of morbid events leading to directly to death or circumstance of the accident or violence that produced a fatal injury. So uh, for Australia, um, we only need to put down, for example, if they, they have cancer, generally, um, unless it's very clear that it's something else uh, caused the death. Otherwise, most of the time, there will be complication from the cancer, or if they ever have an infective event, uh, it will be because of the underlying cancer or other life-limiting illnesses that they don't, they're not, um, uh, they're not going to respond to treatment. So. So generally, the primary uh, cause to be put down is reasonable. So in some cases, we may approach the hospital doctors to complete it. And that may be um, pre-existing arrangement where um, uh, for whatever reason, they may be under a hospital still. And an example would be a hospital and a home program. In some cases, if the banks here physicians have met um, the person before and, um, and the GP is not available, and we may um, help out, we, we're eligible to help out. Um, and uh, if really no one is able to complete the certification, then the case uh, is passed to the office of the coroner.
I think this is uh, for head back. Yes. So we're back to grief and bereavement. Uh, community palliative care service offer support and counselling for individuals and families. Um, we provide information and education on grief, loss and bereavement. Uh, Banksia itself, we do have remembrance services. Um, we do invite bereaved families to join us uh, in remembrance services. There's also walking groups um, for bereaved families to um, get together um, and we have the social workers and counsellors in those walking groups. Um, Banksia does provide bereavement for 13 months post-death um, and in special circumstances can continue, otherwise be um, passed over to, I think it's Australian Grief and Bereavement Service if that needs to continue. Um, we have the website there, Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement, if any, if that ever needs to be um, passed on for family members. So we're on to prescribing opioids in palliative care and the role of the GP. Back to you. Sorry, Chen, is You're it? You're on mute, Chen. Thank you. So, uh, was there any questions from the previous section? Sorry, Jen. Uh, no, none have come through just yet. Okay, no problem. So, um, the goal of this section is about uh, opioid prescribing and again, um, how we uh, coordinate and uh, manage these needs in the community. So we want to go through the general understanding of commonly encountered opioids and discuss prescribing requests from us to uh, most of the time to the GP and discussing PBS requirements uh, for opioid prescribing and palliative care. So we won't be covering molecular and pharmacodynamics in detail and you'll be glad to know and um, won't be talking about opioids in chronic non-malignant pain. So this is for people who have a life limiting illness. So, yeah. so again, um, the GP continues to be the primary prescriber slash the main doctor, essentially, uh, even when community health care is involved. And it's a consultative at, at most shared care setup. And, um, but the, the nurses are, um, are everyone's eyes and ears and uh, will liaise with um, the primary doctor about um, the current situation and the needs. So we have acute symptom management and like we described before, anticipatory medications, specifically talking about making sure medications are in the house. Um, so if the person uh, is deteriorating and wants to stay home and unable to take oral medications, then there are injectables available and life care support to continue that. And, um, and also their regular opioids to be continued. So in terms of acute symptom management, opioids are used for pain and for breathlessness. So we'll have a quick Cook's tour. So they act on opioid receptors in the brain and the spinal cord. And we have um, strong opioids and weak opioids. So the strong opioids are the ones uh, we use more. They're more predictable. You can use, if, if we're worried about uh, strength, we can use a smaller dose and they can all be converted to oral morphine equivalents. Now the com ones we'll go through today will be morphine, hypermorphone, and fentanyl and methadone to a degree. Um, and we'll talk about um, why we use it and how we set it up. And uh, weak opioids, um, tepanadol, codeine, and buprenorphine. Now the thing is though, weak opioids are not that weak. So um, they're less predictable, um, although they have uh, 
less associated uh, opioid side effects. Uh, opioid sparing is often not part of the agenda in palliative patients. And we can go through that in a bit more detail. So again, we use strong opioids in small doses rather than weak opioids. And um, we do consider a background dose and breakthrough dose. So background dose is there, the way I, I talk to the patients is that they are uh, there to prevent the pain. And we usually use long acting formulations so they don't have to take one every six hours. They can take it twice a day, once a day, or a patch that's changed every three days. Um, breakthrough doses, uh, usually, so essentially dose to use for breakthrough pain or incidental pain is usually one six to one twelfth of the total daily dose. And we usually use immediate release formulation because breakthrough pain episodes, hopefully it's not going to be there for 12 hours, then that would just be background pain. So breakthrough pain uh, should be covered by the immediate release that wouldn't uh, that would last about four hours. So um, it may not be more than that. <coughs> we try to stick to the same molecule where possible for pred predictability. And everyone needs to learn how to use laxatives to make sure they don't go into constipation. And this is a bit of a diagram of why we have a background in the breakthrough pain set up. And um, we know that if we try to cover all the breakthrough pains or incident pains with a background analgesia, then there'll be too much during the troughs. So it is the way generally we find the best routine is to use the a minimum effective dose to cover the background pain and where there is breakthrough pain or incident pain, then we use um, the short acting. Right, next. So just quickly um, reminding people that cancer pain is by far the most common reason we use opioids and uh, most proven as well. So uh, if people with moderate to severe cancer pain, uh, in 19 out of 20 people, that we can reduce it to mild to no pain within 14 days. And when we say if they can tolerate the side effects, uh, it really is two sides of the same coin because uh, the aim is to achieve analgesia without causing unacceptable side effects. Um, and if you can't uh, achieve that, if, if we have those limiting side effects, then essentially they're not responding to that agent right there. Most people will have side effects. By that we meant uh, constipation, nausea and vomiting. And constipation is fairly, or, or the need to learn to manage constipation slash prevent constipation is pretty universal. And that's even without opioids, because when the body's slowing down, um, the gut slows down as well. And people can be, often are constipated even without additional medications. And certainly they will need to consider titrating their laxatives um, if they're on opioid medications. Nausea vomiting is uh, slightly less common in constipation and uh, again potentially manageable with use of antiemetics and it's not a contra absolute contraindications. But there are side effects like hallucinations or delirium where uh, it's very hard not to, uh, not to switch the medication for. The one in ten, one to two out of ten will require change. So things like fatigue and nausea vomiting, as we talked about, and drowsiness uh, can get better as, um, as the person get used more used to the medication. And um, it's common, they're commonly labeled as allergy, as we discussed before, but uh, really, uh, they, they may be something we warn the people about, and that um, 
overall, I often talk about pain also tires people out. And that um, there are multiple other reasons to be tired and drowsy often. And, um, and whether it's avoidable is another question. So nausea vomiting, again, um, not an uncommon practice to have antiemetics on hand anyway, because that can be part of many other disease problems. On the other hand, something like constipation, it's common and ongoing, and everyone needs to learn how to manage laxatives. Uh, other things like dry mouth, urinary retention, itch, hyperalgesia, confusion, hallucinations, sedation, mild chronic, respiratory depression, and dependence. Um, again, they all may mean we need to actually change the agent um, slash uh, ensure uh, access to, to a working agent. And next. So we generally start with the immediate release um, because of course, if that's one that they can't tolerate, uh, they won't last 12 hours. It would just be four hours. And then, uh, yeah, we can test if they, how much they tolerate before we introduce a background dose. Uh, there is no upper limit. Uh, so it is uh, decided by dose limiting toxicity slash side effects. And we mentioned that particularly the hallucinations, delirium, so the neuro um, excitatory side effects are the big ones that we really have low threshold of changing agents for. And the thing is, it's not that we stop them, it's we switch the opioids. Because of course, the, the reason that they have pain or the reason they need opioids probably hasn't gone away. Um, drowsiness is, is um, most of the time, it's something we try to avoid. Um, and certainly we don't use opioids as sedatives because if we need to uh, sedate people or make people more sleepy, there are sleeping pills and benzodiazepines available that's much more reliable and much less likely to cause neuroexcitatory side effects. Um, on the other hand, um, if we have out of options in terms of analgesia and their side effects, it's a bit of drowsiness. Um, plus, it may or may not be avoidable because if they're close to terminal or in terminal phase, drowsiness may not be avoidable. Then we may not straight away jump into switching opioids. But neuroexcitatory things like hallucinations, universally, we would, we would, well, I should say, we're very, very strongly considering getting another agent. In terms of when to add or increase background doses. So um, as we discussed before, um, the breakthrough pains may be better managed with immediate release anyway. So um, overall, uh, everyone has different rules, but you know, it's common to say if they need less than three top-ups per day, then perhaps they don't need a background. I think especially if they're not waking up at night and they can you know, just manage the breakthrough with the media release, that's perfectly fine as well. So we talked about, oh, I think we didn't have that uh, oxycodone in that list of strong opioids before, but oxycodone certainly is a strong opioid. So morphine, oxycodone, hydromorphone. Fentanyl and methadone are slightly more atypical of their uh, pharmacodynamics. And kinetics actually both. So these common formulations are there. Um, so because we'll send out the slides, uh, I won't go through them in detail. But the key is they all come in different formulations, uh, both immediate release and slow release. Uh, all things highlighted because we had a bit of a shortage. And in fact, we have latest to say there are a few brands coming back in. So um, so it won't be called ordering anymore, but we will still have more thing immediate release or liquids. Um, the tablets, uh, Severdol, um, may be discontinued sometime this year as well. So, uh, but again, we'll all work on making sure there's as many formulations as possible. Because things like uh, practical things like um, people going out, taking some tablets, 
uh, with them in a purse, it's just much easier than carrying a big bottle of hoarding around that they have to draw up on um, when they need it, uh, then rather than popping a tablet. So, um, so all formulations have their benefits um, in terms of lifestyle and how to ma tailor that towards the uh, pain profile. So, both uh, so all morphine, oxycodone, and hydromorphone comes in liquid and tablets, as as currently. And slow release, um, uh, hydromorphone, unfortunately, has um, uh, it has been discontinued in a slow release form. Go to the next slide. Uh, fentanyl, and uh, people will be more familiar with the fentanyl patches, which being around for longer. We now have also fentanyl uh, lozenges that dissolves under the tongue and absorb transmucosally. Now, it's slightly more unique with this one, this only lasts an hour. So tolerating 12 doses of this doesn't mean people can tolerate the same equivalent amount in a background form, because um, if they have, um, if it doesn't last that long, it really um, is, is not correlatable to um, slightly longer term tolerance. So it's very uh, specifically used for incidental pain that doesn't last that long. Because of course, if you have breakthrough pain that's gonna last longer than an hour, there is no point using abstral. The people should just take an endo that's gonna last four hours rather than take abstral that you'll still need to take an endo afterwards anyway, or take at four abstrals, which just doesn't make sense. So, um, but on the other hand, if they have something, and commonly it's pre-procedure or pre-event, like if they know they're going for a car ride or having a shower, or having dressing changed, and uh, they know they'll have no pain right afterwards. And also especially that they find previously when they take the endone, afterwards they were too sleepy, then that would be the, the best candidate for using fentanyl lozenges. Next, so. Now methadone, we do use for, um, use for pain purposes, and that uh, does not require uh, opioid pharmacotherapy licenses. So they can be prescribed by anyone um, without a permit um, in the palliative setting, provided they're not previously dependent on it or, or you know, previously misused medications. Um, then they can be, methadone can be prescribed um, like all the other opioids. Uh, on the other hand, because the pharmacology is actually tricky, so this is something where um, uh, we'll also keep an eye on together with, with the GPs. So um, generally titration would come from, come from a specialist doctor, and then um, the, the generalist and, and the GPs would, would be continuing the same dose rather than uh, titrating it. It does come injectables, and um, and it's uh, personally, my experience is it's very important to make sure that's available um, if someone's uh, required methadone for pain management. Because often, um, if we had to, if they can't swallow their tablets and they had to switch um, to injectables, and, and we inevitably put them back on the previous opioids that wasn't working, because chances are methadone was added because the previous opioid was not working then again, we run into the side effects. Because remember, when the opioid's not working, it means they're getting side effects without energy, without energy easier. So yeah, so um, I've seen a few cases that people gone back into hyperalgesia or delirium and terminal phase on, because unnecessarily because uh, injectable methadone wasn't organized. So th there's a few catch around methadone that it does require additional monitoring, but we do work closely with the family doctor to continue the care. So another quick mention is the Targin and Oxycontin. Now Targin is, um, is very much marketed uh, more so than Oxycontin because of the naloxone factor, it's less constipating and um, it's thought to be safer as well. 
just in case people decide to uh, sell it or abuse it and inject it. And then naloxone would deter that. Now, on the other hand, not that, that there's much evidence and because it's not easy to collect uh, data of misuse. Um, on the other hand, uh, Tarjan or naloxone really is not um, something that's uh, predictable in our population. Because uh, for it to not affect the analgesia, the liver needs to be working. And for our patients, um, dying person, one is they often have liver impairment anyway. Two is if they go into multi-organ failure, then the liver will still be stuck. So you have a, a formulation that may actually not be working to its full capacity. Um, and you just don't know how much of the 10 milligram of oxycodone is working when you combine it with naloxone in our population. So, uh, so much so that often when Tidin is not working, rather than switching the opioid, we change it back to oxycontin to remove the naloxone. And many people actually then report um, improved pain in that setting, improved uh, analgesia, I should say. Uh, the other issue, of course, is the uh, constipation pre uh, prevention effect, because as we discussed before, um, chances are they still need to use laxatives. They may need to use less, but they still need to manage the laxatives. And, um, and often it's just easier to get the pain right than, um, than worry about the laxative amount. Weak opioids, as we discussed, prefer to avoid because we're not really trying to spare opioids in cancer pain. And, uh, and in fact, this can still cause side effects and um, and we need to work out um, whether there is there is um, agenda to spare opioids, and that may be because uh, there are features that um, that we know it's not going to respond well anyway. So often the non-malignant pains, um, people often start getting you know, side effects from opioids before they get um, you know, a good response. And of course, what happens is people often, if if medication is not working, they'll end up taking more and they have more side effects. So non-malignant pain, we do consider Norspan or um, Polexia. Things like codeine and tramadol, though, it's, um, they're quite tricky. Codeine has the full constipating effect in the, in the gut, and only one-tenth of it becomes um, the equivalent morphine dose uh, in the systemic circulation. But 400% of it works as a constipating agent. So, and that's often not what we need. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if they have um, high output stoma or other sort of um, gut issues, we might use that, but that's not for pain. Tramadol, um, because of the uh, SSRI effects um, or serotonergic effects, I should say, and potential to interact with SSRIs and other antidepressants, um, it's more likely to cause delirium than other opioids in the elderly. So, um, which is why we do try to avoid it. Keep going. So, we, uh, it, yes, and there is another formulation of buprenorphine, which is 10 gzik It's not PBS listed, but it's actually pretty useful if someone, we are going to use uh, Norspan 4 in non malignant pain. Then 10 gzik it's a it's a valuable to remember. Keep going. Yeah, and tependido comes in both immediate release and modified release. Now, one thing about tependido immediate release is because um, uh, the other opioids we often would say oh, people can take it every half an hour, every hour, because they have someone they can call while they are the program. So often. Um, the duration of effect is uh, is used as the uh, the frequency for the PRNs, but uh, for opioids we can actually use onset of action, um, and in the setting that they have someone they can call, because of course if they have side effects they need to call us rather than you know just keep popping every hour, or if it's not working as well they should be calling the, the PLP on call. Um, 
On the other hand, Plexia immediate release, because it's not a pure opioid, yes, it still has some, like tremolo, but much less, it still has some serotonin effect, and you may have some delayed onset of side effects. Therefore, we, at the moment, we don't support uh, uh, use onset of action as the frequency. We still stick to the four hours. In opioids and breathlessness, uh, much less evidence and basically all around use of morphine. And we're talking about up to 40, in fact, up, up to 30 milligrams daily. More than 30 milligrams, uh, often people will start having more side effects already. And um, in contrast to pain, uh, you don't keep increasing the dose. And that's because uh, of several factors. One is um, breathlessness is often an incidental phenomenon. And, um, and people often say they're breathless and because they, they can't do things they want to do. But in fact, it's also the underlying function that's limiting them doing what they can want to do. And opioids, while it acts on the sensation of breathlessness, it does not enable people to do things they want to do. Um, if it's if there's components of weakness, components of other functional, other underlying problems. And generally, the component breathlessness would have responded um, up to maximum of 40 milligrams of morphine. Uh, that does not mean we can't increase it. Um, it just means we have to keep a very close eye on whether it's truly working and not causing a side effect. Um, whereas um, for people who report pain, it's often slightly easier saying that though there are a lot of things that gets labeled as pain as well but often it's slightly more clear cut to know whether the opioids working or not based on the, their reporting. The other issue with breathlessness uh, is that um, uh, because it's so incidental, um, a background opioid um, may be insufficient for those episodes still. So we often say prior to doing something like showering or morning routine, that's the commonest things, take an immediate release dose. I personally often start with that because then you get to test whether they're tolerated before you start a, a modified release. Keep going. So lots of barriers to appropriate op opioid use. And um, they are, in a way, high-risk medications, uh, especially around supply. As we all know, uh, community and opioid problems, um, like what we worry about is not about the patient, but if someone else is taking it, basically. And um, there's also a lot of rules and regulations and uh, that eats into our precious time in terms of um, clinical care. And a lot of the time is filled with phone calls and paperwork. Um, and also that there is a, a bit of association of opioid with um, things like dependence addictions. And in fact, in the case of morphine, about death. And there is a bit of, a bit of blame sometimes in the patient factor. Um, in the patient's side, they often don't want to complain. They feel like, you know, they don't need it. Um, they, they're worried about what it means if they need it, um, but also about what it means if they need it now and whether it means this, they can't have other options in the future. Uh, there's certainly cultural, historical backgrounds um, of uh, opioid uh, issues, societal issues, that's uh, in exploitations that's led to um, uh, reluctance in specific groups especially in Asia, and, um, and also general fear of opioids. So it is quite common when you to uh, dispel the expectations and, and um, misconceptions that, in fact, um, uh, 
you know, more things not associated with dying and we should be managing the pain better. And in fact, often if the symptoms manage better, um, especially if there were uh, a barrier to activities daily living. So if people are not walking as much as they should be, if they're not sleeping as well as they should be because of pain, then certainly uh, using opioids uh, is very much helpful. Um, in terms of um, not wanting to become addicted, um, in this group of patients, is, the risk is very low. In a way, they are dependent in that because the cause of the pain hasn't disappeared. So um, the pain will come back if you stop it. But no one generally will be taking it recreationally at the stage um, all of a sudden that hasn't been part of the part of the um, intentions earlier on. So um, and th there's that worry about uh, running other options and um, especially nowadays it's not the case. Uh, we have more than one strong opioid option as you've seen. Um, Plus, in fact, in cancer pain, tolerance is actually not common. And yes, we have that uh, culture of not to use drugs. And uh, it is there are some um, stigma associated with opioids or other drug dependence and uh, that we do need to overcome and discuss. So we briefly mentioned that everything can be converted to oral morphine equivalents, and, um, and that's how we calculate doses. Uh, essentially, when it comes to switching, like we talked about, we run into those and side effects with one of them, then we would um, uh, use these conversions to work out what to use, uh, what dose to use for the new opioid. We generally do some dose reduction, because of course, if uh, uh, it comes back to side effects and whether they work is two sides of the same coin. So if we're switching opioids, um, uh, we should be able to get away with the lower dose um, if it's more effective and therefore also avoid the side effects at the same time. And that come, that underpins the rationale of switching opioids. So patches are good for stable pain, but they are hard to titrate because just the fact that they take so long to stay, to reach steady state. But it's not that they don't work straight away, um, but if you titrate too early, you might overshoot. And, um, there are other issues like body hepatitis being a problem because um, people might not absorb the patch if they're too, too thin. And, um, it might not stick. So adherence uh, literally can be a problem. Um, but also that because they don't go in Webster packs um, and often people need physical assistance to put them on as well. So um, they may not be able to adhere to it or remember it as well as um, other things. So that's the conversion there again. Let's we'll keep going. So again, um, we do rely on the sorry, previous. Yeah, we do rely on the GP to be the main prescriber, but of course, if there's any other issues, um, yeah, feel free, free to give us a ring, and, um, and we can work out how things are going, and uh, certainly can advise on dosing and provide additional reviews. So, um, when someone's living at home, there's no no other service really to be able to take over the regular prescribing slash medical input. So we talked about interspiratory medications a bit earlier already. And um, main thing, the, the choice really comes back to, you know, timing. We talk about if people want to stay home, uh, especially for terminal phase care, where chances are they won't be able to take their tablets then we need to make sure something's available to so they don't withdraw because uh, of course the cancer has gone away so um, chances that it will need to continue uh, the opioid in some form 
Um, so there's just some examples of um, those there um, in the background, and um, and certainly something that um, if, if you have questions about um, dosing, then certainly um, bringing up the, the our service and go through exactly what those uh, is, is good. Um, generally, we'll put some suggestions on the doses already um, in the correspondence that we sent, as you've seen um, previously, Amanda mentioned. Okay. Um, so, um, Yeah, that's very much the same. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, keep going. So coming back to the PBS requirements and people nowadays actually because of safe script, we don't need a permit anymore to prescribe opioids for patients receiving palliative care and for cancer pain. Um, because safe scripts will monitor that already. Um, Co-PBS allows one month supply of medications um, and as you know some of them does mean uh, calling to get an authority number uh, if the packet um, is, is less than one month for the person. So if someone's taking also 10 milligrams twice a day and and don't by using about three per day um, then they can have 56 tablets of oxycontin and 60 tablets of interim per month. And often we will be suggesting to the patients to make uh, at least monthly appointments, if not more, with their uh, family doctor to make sure um, there's no interruptions or they don't run out. And that is a very big worry in the patients because um, Again, they don't want to be perceived as drug seeking. Um, people actually sometimes um, stop taking ration their medications because they don't, you know, they worry about running out of supply. And that really is the last thing they need um, when they have cancer pain that's interrupting their life. Um, so uh, when they reach the stage where community power care is involved, they often have problem getting to uh, the clinic as well, so um, that's a barrier. Though nowadays telehealth is very available, and uh, and you can be assured that um, our nurses do home visits, so and can check in and make sure there's no signs of misuse or diversion in the house. And certainly, if you're concerned, you can always ring up and check when the last visit was and was there any issues. Um, so we say three weekly because, uh, in a sense, uh, if we make it four, four weekly on the dots, then people might run out if, if the appointment, they couldn't attend the appointment. Um, and of course, the time and remuneration and other things can be a problem uh, with our Medicare having been uh, adequately uh, reviewed. Saying that though, um, Continuing these these inputs are fairly straightforward because there there should be a plenty of updates that you'll be receiving from the public health care services uh, to assure you that things are going safely. Uh, as you know, safe screen needs to be checked um, uh, routinely, and um, with terminal. Patients uh, with no injectables, often we say uh, up to one week at a time with repeats. So um, you know, people can pick up one repeat at a time. And uh, so rather than giving them one month's worth of injectable morphine, then we'll pick up one week's worth at a time. But have the option to pick up the repeat if they run out early um, or not if um, they don't need it further. The Health care section on PBS has streamlined authorities, and so a lot of them have streamlined authorities. Keep going. So, this is another case. Um, I'm just checking. 
I wonder whether because we only have half an hour, we might we might I think we might skip this case. Um, what do you reckon, Amanda? Yeah, certainly. certainly. Yeah. It does sound repetitious, yeah. Yeah. I think we might go straight to the next section, yeah. Which is the uh, fun section. <laughs> so um the it, this is sec this section is about um, and again there's no questions coming through I, I presume again. Uh, no, not just yet. So just a reminder to people to put, pop them in the Q and A box if you have them. Okay, great. So um, uh, this last final section is about essential conversations with patients and their carers. So um, the topics to cover are. Um, disease trajectory care, essentially limitation of treatments, not limitation of care, because uh, we either care or we don't, <laughs> but treatments only have their limits. And uh, we need to make sure, in fact, people uh, who um, the treatment's not helping them, they need more care. Um, informed consent, health care and human rights, terminal phase changes, ACP, and wish to hasten death. So, um, I often start with this quote, and this is, as you can see, why neurology would say this. <laughs> this is uh, CPR is a treatment for cardiac and respiratory arrest. Clearly, if you're dying from a stroke, that's not going to help you. Um, so, with disease trajectory and care, um, often people have a predictable decline. Um, and, and a cancer one often you know, function remains and then uh, goes along this smooth um, down curve with a few episodes in between when they have the infection, bleeding, other complications, but could end, uh, and one of them could end the life, of course, but they also predictably, as the function deteriorates, their time we know is shorter. And, um, and other curves you might have seen, especially in chronic diseases, uh, the, they may have a very low function. So it's a similar curve, but the function is on a very low line, and it's much more drawn out. So what happens is if a function is not great, then um, it's important to remember that um, uh, a lot of the treatments will not achieve the desired outcome. So some just won't work. CPR is a good example. If you're dying from a stroke, CPR is just not going to do anything. Um, some are unacceptably burdensome because, of course, uh, some people will not want to come to hospital already. And, um, and some won't enable recovery to an acceptable lifestyle for the person. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, an example would be uh, ICU. And arguably, you can say hospital admissions if you're doing that for treatment, because um, a successful ICU admission is the one you come out of. It's not the one you keep breathing, because the machine does that for you. <coughs> but it's the one that you can actually walk out. So important to know that we shouldn't be offering or continuing treatments that's not beneficial. And that's defined by those three points before. On the other hand, we need to make sure the symptoms are managed and care needs are met, regardless of the treatments working. And then making sure, um, knowing the non-beneficial treatments and limitations of them allows people to spend time uh, to focus on the right care, right time, and right place. And this underpins the uh, introductions of care. So in terms of advanced care planning, people talk about uh, what their preferences are um, when they're well, and, um, and eventually when they're unwell, so they can plan when they can still plan. You can see curative and restorative care often start losing in fact when functional deteriorates and they will start needing more and more palliative care um, which is really just care it's just making sure 
we, we recognize people need more care when a treatment's not working. So assisted dying is there and more by uh, definition and knowing that um, currently it's uh, the last six months or last 12 months of life that people will be eligible. Um, but it's also important to remember that that is not, um, that does not replace care. Um, so uh, having that as an option still means uh, in fact, some people will need even more care to make sure uh, they, they can access that. On the other hand, um, care needs to be provided regardless whether they're hastening their death or not. Um, and the, you have the terminal phase care, which is specifically referring to people who um, are bed down, have altered, if, if not uh, have lost consciousness and uh, will need a um, very specific set of care. Uh, to make sure they don't get complications like um, bed sores or um, unmanaged symptoms. And then you have bereavement for the family. So um, over to you, Amanda. Now, the, um, the idea is uh, just for everyone to give a, by everyone, that means the both of us, <laughs> to give a, a bit of an example of how we would answer these questions when, um, when we were asked by the patients. So, um, so yeah, so would you like to specifically share some tips uh, about any of these four hard questions? Yeah, certainly. It's always um, good to really talk about what the aim is about having end of life at home, what we want to achieve, what is the benefit of uh, things, treatment options, hospital antibiotic, IV drip and outcomes. It's a lot of reassurance, a lot of explanation, reassuring the family, is this of benefit? Is this more traumatic to put your loved one through this than um, the outcome? So. I would always say it's all choices. We support your choices, but is it of benefit? So certainly I would encounter those, all of those <laughs> four things there very commonly. So it's a lot about reassurance and outcomes. So sorry, Chen, what are you, what are you saying? Which one do I hear the most often or what my responses are? Yeah. So mm. how, how would you... Um... Mm. Like if literally, you know, the family member says, uh, "Can we yeah. at least give subcut fluids?" How yes. would you respond to that? <laughs> well, my response is always, "The bo the body is slowing down. You're giving fluids into the body. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to the kidneys to come out as urine. It's going to places it shouldn't go to." You're going to have pooling of fluids. You're going to have edema. You're going to have increased fluid on the lungs. The fluid that you think is going in so that they're hydrating your loved one is actually going to cause more complications and um, have more side effects and detrimental effects than what you're thinking is going to be good for them. So, um yeah, just trying to explain to the family that we're not in the situation of um, extending the person is dying. This isn't going to have the benefit. Um, and unfortunately, that conversation of what this death might look like and reassure them that that person isn't distressed by not having fluids. There isn't, they're not thirsty, they're not aware, and um, it isn't of benefit. So... A lot of explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we'll go to the next one. So, um, in terms of challenges around um, limiting treatment, um, in a way, not starting is probably the easiest. Um, or it has some unique challenges, of course, because if they've never had the treatment before, then don't really know what the treatment entails. Uh, often we give the example of CPR because, um, uh, in fact, if you see the TV, uh, 
CPI is almost always successful. Um, whereas we know in the community, in fact, um, even if it's cardiopulmonary arrest, so we're not talking about dying from stroke, um, it's only less than 20% to restore circulation. So, um, so in one way that it does make it hard to share, achieve that shared understanding, but on the other, um, it's easier than some other discussions below. So stopping preventive treatments is probably the next easiest, um, but it may, may not be straightforward because things like, for example, um, DVT prophylaxis that can work within two weeks, that they can prevent the clot from within two weeks. So they may still be worthwhile provided they're not also bleeding at the same time, and you might be at equal risk of causing problems. On the other hand, something like statin will be very generally quite easy to, to stop and to explain, look, um, it's not preventing anything unless you're going to leave for another year or two. And um, so those things are much easier to, to discuss than anticoagulation or... Um, or DVD prophylaxis. Um, stopping maintenance treatments is certainly the hardest. So we're talking about dialysis. In fact, on the extreme end, we're talking mechanical ventilation. And stopping, stopping NIVs, um, people can die straight away. So, uh, so those are arguably the hardest uh, discussions to have. Uh, Important, the other important thing to remember is to set limits on trials and treatments. So um, the example is often, well, can we try some anti antibiotics? Well, yes, but maybe only oral. If the oral is not working, it's probably not worth pushing for IVs generally, and probably only for a few days, because um, if there's no response within a few days, then chances are it's not working. And reminding people that the situation is not the same as before. Um, it is important to, to remember people have the right to ask doctors for a second opinion. So, um, so that's, they, they do, um, uh, and they, they should be enabled to, to seek that. Uh, on the other hand, it's also our responsibility to make sure we uh, provide our the, the professional understanding of whether the treatment's going to work or not. So, in terms of advanced care planning, uh, I think, um, okay, so, great, it's still me. Good. Um, so, encouraging people to talk about their wishes for end of life um, is very important because it's best having these discussions before you need to make the decisions and um, and health providers really need to have an honest and culturally sensitive conversation. And it is about preparation. Um, keep going, yeah. So the few conversation starters um, and it's, it's not easy, but something to remember that as in any with anything in healthcare, really, the later you leave it, the harder it gets. And um, in the sense that with dying, um, everyone really only gets one chance, and uh, it's important to to have the best possible legacy for the person and for their family. There's a few guides um, out there to how to initiate and discuss in the life care issues and the last care planning. And really, um, it's not sufficient in terms of um, the uh, prevalence of this being done in writing. And, and that's uh, uploaded on a file. And we're talking only half in residential care, only 16% in hospitals, and 3% in the 
general practices for over 65 year olds. And um, less than 3% have actual events directives. So um, yeah, it's important to make sure people are aware of, of this, um, this benefit and um, think about having preparations and plans in place. The main aspect, arguably, well, there's two aspects, and there's the substitute decision maker and also the MS care director. Arguably, the substitute decision maker is more important because that's where um, if the person himself can ask the questions, then they have someone else appointed to do that for them. Um, whereas the MS care directives, um, it's good to have it in writing because then um, it can be more visible to the system. And as we all know, a lot of things, um, especially uh, opinions and preferences can disappear in the healthcare system very quickly. So having something in writing is very important to make sure it's visible and respected. Uh, and arguably the most important thing is to write down what you don't want. Um, and, um, and in terms of what people want, it's good to write down too, but it's especially important to write down what people don't want. So specifically about refusal of treatment is people can write um, uh, in their instruction directive, and that is uh, then legally valid to uh, stop healthcare care practitioners to, to do it. Uh, there are some instances, of course, if um, the practitioner is not aware of this, this document. And um, sorry, my light's just gone off, so uh, the light is gone weird. <laughs> um, then, then um, but on the other hand, if people become aware of the instruction directive to refuse the treatment, then um, legally, it's a, it is legally binding. If we keep going. All right, the next set of hard questions uh, relates to informed consent. And that's because Pfizer care uh, does have a bit of a stigma, or we should say overall as a society, we have a very strong and prevalent death phobia. You can argue that's perhaps biologically intrinsic to be fearful of dying. Um, but practically, that means uh, there's a lot of withholding information requests. Um, so would you like to share a bit about how you approach these requests, Amanda? Yes, we certainly do encounter this on a regular basis, certainly from intake, uh, from the initial um, um, referral and contact to family. We actually ask for verbal consent to be involved in their care. We certainly ask for a signature um, of consent from the client to be involved. Family will often um, stop us at the door, make an alert, please put this on the file. We're not allowed to use certain words. Uh, you're not allowed to say you're from palliative care. Certainly cannot say the cancer word. Uh, we do have badges identifying ourselves. Um, the nurses don't don't um, block anything that that is why they're there, and we are from Banksia Palliative Care. But certainly, um, getting signatures from next of kin often. Um, not the client themselves sometimes. And then also we have um, inter the use of an interpreter service and often other um, cultures don't like us to tell the, the, the parents of um, palliative care involvement. So, yeah, it's certainly encountered a lot, but we do ask for signed consent and verbal consent for the, for us to be involved. It's quite difficult. Yeah, 
if you go to the next slide. So informed consent is actually mostly around treatment. So, um, and, and that would that would apply um, in the sense that um, if you classify um, being involved with a professional service as treatment, um, but it will be more black and white in terms of things like medications. Um, care provision not necessarily falls under this completely, um, but of course we don't um, we don't want to. Uh, uh, sort of kick down the door <laughs> if um, yeah if people are not in agreement to have care provided. So um, but yeah but the law is more related to the actual treatments. Um, so in a sense, as long as they're accepting of the care, um, there's no reason we need to keep harping on about um, the cancer or the dying, um, if they're going with the flow and happy with um, happy with the care involvement, I think um, where it comes to refusal of care, that's where it's a bit more challenging, and um, and we will need to talk about it a bit more uh, in the following slides. But there is actually specific mention in the law about um, uh, palliative care for someone who doesn't have decision-making capacity um, and by bypassing the uh, medical treatment decision-maker. Um, on the other hand, uh, that person does need to be uh, informed and, um, and that the, uh, uh, the, the decision to, to support palliative care um, needs to have regard to the purpose and value of the person. The dying person. So yeah, so um, and, and that brings us to, I guess, the treatment or the medication use, or uh, perhaps the um, the eating and drinking aspects. So, uh, any tips on how you answer either or both of those two? Just a lot of reassurance once again, just that they're unable to eat, they're not awake enough to eat, the body isn't requiring um, food and energy, their body's slowing down, and just a lot of uh, discussions around the dying process and what it looks like, that we expect this to happen. We do expect people uh, to have very poor oral intake. We do expect them uh, to not to lose their swallow, to not be able to get food and fluids in anymore. You know, just a lot of reassurance. This is expected. This is what the dying process looks like. This isn't anything to be scared of. Um, and I think if we empower families with the knowledge of what to expect, what this is going to look like, the um, the anxiety around watching someone die, hopefully, um, they is reduced and they do feel um, supported that this is expected. It's not it's not um, something that shouldn't that should be scary to them. It is the process of dying um, and we will support them through it. And certainly the hesitancy around morphine, to reassure them that these aren't lethal doses, these are purely symptom management, uh, symptom doses for pain relief um, to manage their symptom. Um, it isn't a dose that is going to end their life. Lots of calm conversation and reassurance. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I might quickly skip these parts um, to our next questions um, but essentially um, uh, you know there, there are legal protections as long as people are acting in um, in good faith and that if there's urgent issues to 
relieve the suffering, then um, then we are protected legally um, in terms of anything palliative. In terms of um, uh, the food and fluids, I often do also mention to remind people that um, it's because people are dying, therefore they can't eat, not the other way around. So the next set of things that often comes up is the terminal phase changes, and um, and these are these are, I might quickly shoot through these because um, I don't want to run out of time for the last bits, um, the last housekeeping bits. So um, essentially, the respiratory changes quite high yield. Um, the confusion between agitation and pain is quite high yield as well. And also that um, uh, whether people need to be repositioned, and um, the, the respiratory ones, uh, important to to reassure people that uh, the the death rattle or the increasing upper airway sounds are secondary to losing consciousness. So it's in fact it's like snoring, and it gets louder when people lose are deeply un unconscious. So. There is a bit more secretions as part of that, but in fact, a lot of that is muscles, which is why anti-secretaries don't always work either. We can give anti-secretaries, but it's also important to reorientate everyone that, well, if it's secondary to losing consciousness, the person acting does not. The importance of differentiating between agitation and pain is because um, morphine doesn't work on agitation. It's not a reliable service. Um, therefore, uh, midazolam is also there. <laughs> And it's important to know which one's going to uh, be more effective and to use which. And often, um, yeah, pain is limiting. People are frozen in pain. They don't want to move because often movements, depending on the etiology, but a lot of the etiologies, pain will be worse with movements. So um, uh, if you're actually restless and getting out of bed, it's probably agitation, which still needs medication, but you know, the right one, not the old one. And, uh, and the last one really is to make sure preventing um, skin, skin issues um, is, is very important. And um, pre-care analgesia is, is quite a common, uh, common use. So uh, yeah, we'll keep going. So this is um, preempting the, the last little challenging question is uh, wish to hasten death and uh, this is not a remark made to me, but uh, one of my colleagues uh, have, been, have heard people say to him, well, why do you need doctors for palliative care? Don't you just give them more, more team? Um, again, it comes back to actually, you know, that we're, we're there to provide the care. If the person's you know, dead, they don't need more care, or the families do, but the, the person doesn't. <laughs> but we also don't use more team. So. Um, and the common things, as you may have heard, is that people remarking that this is not life, this is just suffering, you wouldn't do this to a dog. Mind you, we don't actually ask what the dog wants, so uh, it's not quite the right comparison. Uh, we, we, you know, go through, uh, we, we go through treatments with uh, patients, not, we don't, we don't do things to people, we uh, do things with people. Um, can't you make this end sooner? People just want, you know, their relatives sleeping and not wake up. And of, of course, morphing is the poster boy for uh, the medication that hasten there. And, and the issue is um, uh, opioids and benzos are not reliable for agents. So they don't actually feature in lethal substances used uh, or, or assisted dying substances used anywhere because um, they actually can't uh, achieve a reliable death. Um, and often you always actually run into, uh, one is you might set up expectations that, and people feel like you're dragging things on um, if you set up expectation that they will hasten death, um, but chances are they don't. And people feel like there's a prolonged terminal phase, which in fact, they were just not that close at the beginning. Um, the other thing, as we've discussed, is they can cause uh, neuropsychiatric side effects. Um, and benzos is less likely, but they can cause paradoxical effects as well. So, um, again, we wouldn't use them unless there's a reason to, unless they're in pain or agitated. 
Um, but of course, if we perpetuate their association with, with dying, then uh, people are reluctant to use them in timely fashion. So they may be in pain longer than they need to when they're you know, um, living with cancer pain. Uh, it's important to remember that desire to die doesn't mean they want people to do something about it. And um, which means we need to distinguish a wish to hasten death from uh, acceptance of impending death. Or for, I wish to die naturally, but preferably so. Okay, next. Uh, we might, uh, so, so again, coming back to Palkia, neither haste nor postpone death. And really, uh, whether people are accessing death hastening interventions or not, uh, they still need the care. And as we discussed, sometimes they need more care. So it's very important to make sure um, palliative care continues to be uh, part of the overall care setup, either way. Okay, so um, uh, very quickly, uh, so Amanda, can you quickly talk about finding palliative care services? Um, you, there is palliative um, care Victoria website if, if uh, you need to find a specific um, palliative care service for an area. Um, I'm not quite sure of this slide, to be honest, Jim. Oh, yeah, that, that, that was it. <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And just making sure we uh, remind people that it, we've got the next one. Yeah. And certainly to refer to Banksy a Palliative Service. Um, on our website, there is a how to refer section. It's a click on. Anyone can certainly, uh, client, family, and friends, and, uh, um, and healthcare providers. Certainly, also to each area. So, whatever community uh, palliative care area, um, log on to their website. So keep going. Yeah. So all the all the um, postcodes are listed there. Yeah. Um, in terms of those three catchments, but yeah, uh, on the palliative care Victoria website, you can find other other services and other postcodes. Okay. So I'll hand back to the PHN to talk about half halfway a bit in the last minute. Yeah, thanks, Chen and Amanda. Um, and just a last call for questions. We don't have any yet, but if you've got any burning ones, I'm conscious of time, so please pop them in if you have them. Um, and yes, just we also have all of those. Uh, so the Melbourne City Mission, Mercy Health, and Banksia were the ones uh, listed in the northwestern Melbourne. PHN catchment and we do have their details on our website as well. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to Health Pathways. So um, Health Pathways is our kind of one-stop shop for um, management guidelines and referral pathways uh, for a whole host of uh, clinical topics, but um, including palliative care. So we actually have, uh, there's over 40 palliative care pathways um, covering, as you can see there, general guidance and assessment, providers, medications, uh, essential conversations, symptom control, emergencies, referrals uh, and other resources. So all of those referral details and links are also included um, directly on Health Pathways. Uh, and our Health Pathways team can set you up if you don't already have a login. You can scan that QR code or email uh, the address there and you will receive these slides uh, as in an interactive version post-session. Um, but if you, you can set up a single point login for your practice and get it bookmarked on, on all your um, computers in the practice so that everyone can can access health pathways and those relevant um, referral contacts um, in a very quick and easy fashion, as well as the clinical guidance on the on the pathways themselves. Um, so please do reach out. Um, health Pathways Melbourne covers the northwestern and eastern Melbourne PHN catchment areas. Um, 
so the pathways, some of the content is general across the state and then the referral pathways are localised for the relevant PHN catchment. Um, so certainly if you're in one of the other catchments, do reach out to your PHN for their details. Uh, and I just have put in the chat a couple of um, other resources. So we do have another session coming up with Eastern Melbourne and South Eastern Melbourne PHNs about anticipatory prescribing. So if there's uh, any one who wants more detail on that that content in particular, um, I have put the link in the chat and you will also get the details post session in the email. Um, Banksy Palliative Care also have a more in-depth um, GP webinar series coming up. So um, I don't think registrations for that are quite open yet, but they will be and we will share the link um, post session as well. So this was kind of the, the overview of a lot of information, but um, there's a five part GP targeted webinar series coming up starting uh, in mid April weekly for is it five weeks, Jen. Yeah. Um, yes. Covering a lot of these detail in, in kind of more detail for an hour each. So if there's any of the topics covered at a higher level here that you're interested in, um, please do check our follow up email for the registration links for um, accessing uh, registering for those upcoming sessions. Um, and please do check our resources page, check our events calendar, um, and most importantly, complete our evaluation survey to help us identify other topics that you'd like to hear about. Uh, the PHN is also working on a quality improvement project for general practices to help improve their palliative care approach and advanced care planning um, capability within their teams. Uh, so if you're interested in hearing more about that directly, um, please do fill out the survey. There's an option in there to uh, be contacted directly when there's more information available about that. Uh, and finally, just a couple of acknowledgements from Jen for um, his colleagues at Bally Banksia Palliative Care and Eastern Palliative Care. And we will share... Um, the references and all the slides with some of the additional resources that Jen mentioned, um, they'll all be shared in the post session email as well. So thank you all for attending. Um, we've only gone a couple of minutes over, so that's not too bad. Uh, thank you very much, Jen and Amanda, um, for a really comprehensive session and um, a couple of thank yous in the chat as well from participants, so very well done. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Well done, Chin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.